Good evening. I'm Kathy Johnson, professor of political science and the faculty fellow in democratic studies. And on behalf of the president's office and the W. Ford Schumann class of 50 program in democratic studies, I'd like to welcome you here tonight. P political changes, improvements in the internet, and technological innovations have ushered in a period dubbed Globalization 3.0 by Mr. Tom Friedman. This dynamic era of global trade, cooperation, and competition has resulted in creative and new models of production and collaboration. Doctors in India review CAT scans of American citizens, offering a quick and cheap second opinion. The nation's largest employer, Walmart, used to have as its slogan, Made in America, but now imports more goods from China than the United Kingdom or Russia. And an accounting firm in India last year prepared tax returns for almost half a million American citizens, something that will delight those of you struggling with or procrastinating on your 1040 forms this week. This period of creative destruction in capitalism raises major questions about how we will and should respond as a nation. What should we do to enhance individuals' chances for success to help the winners win? But also, what should we do, if anything, to protect individuals who lose in this global competition? How do we ensure fair competition in a society marked by racial and economic inequality? How can we be passionate and engage democratic citizens if we are first consumers and workers second? And how can we be competent democratic citizens if much of the events that so affect our lives operate outside our borders? The world might well be flat, but tonight in this hall, we will have some hierarchy. Brought to you, created and enforced by those of us with a bit of power. Rule number one, please turn off your cell phones, your beepers, your pagers, anything that beeps. The second set of rules is about the questions. We know that all of you want to ask Mr. Friedman a question. And better yet, all of you want to have your own personal conversation with Tom. A beer at the pub, coffee at Tunnel City, better yet, a four-course dinner at Meze. That cannot happen tonight. And to prevent it, here are the rules for the Q&A that will follow Mr. Friedman's speech. To ask a question, go to the mic that is in the center of the middle hallway. Please ask one and only one question. And this does not mean that you put five questions into one question with multiple parts, with no follow-up questions. We will take the first five questions from students. Students currently attending Williams College, prospective students visiting Williams College, and high school students, regardless of what your plans for college are. Carrie Green, the program coordinator for Democratic Studies, will help you sort out and abide by the rules. She might be little, but she's an enforcer. Before we get to that, I want you to join me in welcoming the 1983 Pulitzer Prize winner for international reporting, the 1988 Pulitzer Prize winner for international reporting, and the 2002 Pulitzer Prize winner for distinguished commentary Mr. Tom Friedman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a treat to be back here uh, at Williams. Um, uh, I've had fond memories of this hall three years ago. Um, and uh, I've been looking forward to this evening for a long time. And thank you all for coming up here and pardon my back, as they say. <laughs> um, 
Before I start, um, well, I'd like to talk about my speaking fee. Um, <laughs> I just, I feel I have to let you in on this. Um, but Morty gave me a choice. He said I could, you know, either get an honorarium or I could get $100 for each kid who comes out of here and decides to go to Williams. So, um, <laughs> you're sort of the over-under. And, um, but I'm hope, uh, I, I, I certainly hope if, um, if you are here visiting um, that you'll be uh, as impressed and inspired by Williams as I have been. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is uh, uh, try to give sort of almost three talks into one. Um, I'm going to first talk about the flat world um, uh, and what I mean by that concept. And then I want to share with you um, some new thinking I've been doing. Uh, I have a 2.0 version of the book coming out next week. Um, uh, and uh, I want to focus on what the flat world means in particular for two areas that I've been thinking a lot about lately, um, education and energy. And I, I hope it'll all um, kind of come together. It's a, Reminds me of the story, you know, when they were digging the tunnel between England and France, um, they put it out to bid, you know, uh, for this, uh, this tunnel under the channel, and um, they got bids of 3 billion, 3.2 billion, 3.1 billion. They got one bid for 100,000 pounds from the firm of Goldberg and Cohn in the Upper East Side of London. Well, for fiduciary reasons, they had to check it out, and they sent a guy up there to check it out, rang the doorbell, down came Mr. Cohn, Goldberg was on the road, and um, uh, they said, Mr. Cohn, we don't understand. How, how can you possibly build a channel for 100,000 pounds? He said, v v v v that's the problem. Uh, Goldberg will start on one side, Cohn will start on the other, and we'll dig with a shovel until we meet. <laughs> I said, well, what if you don't meet? So you'll have two tunnels. <laughs> OK. So I hope these all meet. You may have two speeches. You may have three speeches. I hope it'll all cohere uh, into one. Um, basically, to understand the world is flat, um, you have to understand that this book came about um, completely by accident. Um, I became the Times a Foreign Affairs columnist in January 1995, and really between January 1995 and September 11, 2001, my column really oscillated between what I would call Lexus issues and olive tree issues, issues of technology, globalization, uh, internet um, and issues of traditional geopolitics, ethnic conflict, etc. And I was really in that mode right up till September 11th when in light of what happened that day I really dropped the globalization side of my column and spent the next three years covering the olive tree wars. Um, and I really, as I say, dropped uh, the whole globalization issue. Well I also started doing documentaries for the Discovery Channel and um, in uh, we did one on the roots of 9-11, we did one on the wall Israel was building in the West Bank. And in uh, January of 2004, we were sitting around with our discovery team trying to figure out what to do our next documentary on. And at that time, the issue that seemed most obvious for us to take up was, uh, why does everybody hate America? And, well, how do we get at that? I had this idea, I said, why don't we go to call centers all over the world and interview young people who spend their days imitating Americans on what they think of America. And I thought it'd make a kind of interesting double mirror. Well, we were literally budgeting out that documentary when a certain Democratic presidential hopeful, John Kerry, came out with his blast against Benedict Arnold's CEOs who engage in outsourcing. And suddenly, this issue of outsourcing just exploded onto the world stage. So I said, wait a minute, time out. Why don't we just go to Bangalore, India, the capital of outsourcing, and do a documentary on the other side of outsourcing and try to explain this phenomena from the ground up? And so that's what we did on February 15th of 2004, headed off to Bangalore with my team from the Discovery Channel. And we shot about uh, 60 hours of film over the next 10, 11 days. And across those 10, 11 days, I got progressively sicker and sicker. Uh, and it, it was not the food. It was a realization somewhere between the Indian entrepreneur who offered to do my tax returns from Bangalore and the Indian entrepreneur who wanted to write my new software from Bangalore and the Indian entrepreneur who wanted to read my x-rays from Bangalore and the Indian entrepreneur who wanted to trace my lost luggage on Delta Airlines from Bangalore. I got this really sick feeling that while I had been sleeping, while I had been off covering the 9-11 wars, 
something really big had happened in this globalization story, and I had completely missed it. And it all kind of came together in the last interview I did, which was with Nanda Nilakani, the CEO of Infosys, which is kind of the Microsoft of India. We were sitting on his couch outside his office. Nanda was an old friend. He'd been away during the previous 10 days, and I'd built up all these questions for him. And while the crew was setting up, I sat there with my laptop and um, told him my impressions. And at one point, he said to me, Tom, I've got to tell you, the global economic playing field is being leveled. The global economic playing field is being leveled, and you Americans are not ready. Oh, I wrote that down on my little laptop. The global economic playing field is being leveled. Well, after the interview, I got into my Jeep, went back to the Indian hotel I was staying. It was about an hour drive, and all along the way, I kept rolling over in my head what Nandan had said. The global economic playing field is being leveled. And eventually, it occurred to me that what Nandan was really telling me was that the global economic playing field was being flattened. And then, in the crazy chemical way these things happen, it just popped into my head that what Nandan Nilakani, one of India's premier engineer entrepreneurs, was really telling me was that the world is flat. And I wrote that down in my notebook. The world is flat. And I decided then and there I was going to write a book called The World is Flat. I got back to my hotel. I ran up to my room. I called my wife. I said, honey, I am going to write a book called The World is Flat. She thought that was a brilliant idea. <laughs> That's how we, we remember it now. Um, <laughs> we have a little dispute over that conversation, what was really said. But I did come home and call my editor and, and uh, publisher at the New York Times and basically told them, ladies and gentlemen, I need to go on leave immediately. I need to go on leave immediately because my intellectual software, the framework through which I'm looking at the world, is out of date. I'm, I'm a basic engineer in a Java world. If I don't go on leave immediately and write this book, I am going to write something really stupid in the New York Times. <laughs> it's a great way to get a leave, I have to tell you. It's hard to say no, you know. So I started this book in March of 2004. I turned it in in December. Don't try this trick at home, kids. Um, I blew out my forearms along the way. But it was sort of written in a passion of energy and, and, uh, and curiosity to try to really answer this question, how did the world get flat? Now, the meta-argument of this book, as Kathy alluded to, is that there have been three great era of globalization. The first, I argue, is globalization 1.0. It lasted from 1492 until the early 1800s, the beginning of global arbitrage. And that era of globalization 1.0 shrunk the world from a size large to a size medium. And what characterized that era, what defined that era, was that you went global and the agents of globalization were the country, the nation state. You went global through your country. It was Spain exploring the New World, Portugal, East Asia, Britain colonizing India. Nations impelled by reasons of imperialism uh, or, or a quest for energy or power or whatever. It was the nation state that was the agent of globalization. Globalization 2.0 lasted from the early 1800s till the year 2000. That's right, it just ended. It shrunk the world from size medium to size small. And that year of globalization was really driven by countries globalizing. Countries globalizing, sorry, companies globalizing. Companies globalizing for markets or for labor. So you went global in globalization 2.0 through your company. Well, while you were sleeping, or at least while I was sleeping, we entered globalization 3.0 from the year 2000 to the present. And it's shrinking the world from size small to size tiny and flattening the global economic playing field at the same time. Only what is so unique, so exciting, and so challenging about this year of globalization is that it's not built around countries and it's not built around companies. It's built around individuals. What is new, unique, exciting, terrifying, and challenging about this era of globalization is the ability, and in many cases, the requirement of individuals to globalize themselves and think of themselves as competing globally 
against other individuals. So we've really gone from a globalization in which the dynamic agent was the country to a globalization in which the dynamic agent is the country, company, I'll get that right before I leave, <laughs> to a globalization in which the dynamic agent is the individual. And pay attention, in this year of globalization, it's not going to be a bunch of white Western individuals. It's going to be individuals of all colors of the rainbow. Now, how did we get there? How we got here was, I argue, through 10 forces, events, technologies that really came together. I call them the 10 flatteners, the 10 forces that flattened the world. And let me go through them quickly. I built some of these around a date, so the first date is 11-9. Not 9-11, 11-9. Because in a wonderful Kabbalistic accident of dates, the Berlin Wall fell on 11-9. November 9th, 1989. And I call this first flattener when the walls came down and the windows came up. Because in another wonderful accident of dates, the Windows operating system shipped six months after the fall of the Berlin Wall, Windows 3.0. And so these two events happened at the same time. The wall came down and the windows came up. Why were they such a huge flattener? Well, the fall of the wall was a huge flattener because the fall of the wall is what allowed us to actually think of the world and conceive of it for the first time as a single flat plane. I dare say if we look back at the Williams course curriculum before 1989, you'd find a lot of discussion about Eastern policy and Western policy, Northern policy and Southern policy, but no one was using the word globalization or global policy. You couldn't because there was a wall in the way. Well, that fall, that wall really allowed us to think global. The rise of the windows, though, which for me is a metaphor for the windows-enabled PC. The rise of the windows-enabled PC is what begins this whole individual moment. Because it was the PC which allowed individuals, this is very important, it was the PC which allowed individuals to become authors of their own content in digital form. Now, let me try to make sense of that techno-speak. We've all been authors of our own content ever since cave women, cave men, etched on cave walls. But with the PC, we as individuals could become authors of our own content, words, data, spreadsheets, photo, video, music, in digital form. And when our content was in digital form, it meant it could be manipulated, and distributed in so many more ways. That was the first flattener. Second flattener is also built around a date, uh, a date I consider to be one of the most important in your lifetime. And that date is 8995, August 9th, 1995. Because on August 9th, 1995, a small startup company in Mountain View, California, called Netscape, went public. And the world has never been the same since. Netscape's going public changed the world forever for two reasons. First of all, it was Netscape that gave us the internet. Oh, the internet existed before, but it was Netscape's invention, which was the easy to use, freely downloadable internet browser, which is what brought the internet to life. And that browser was that device which allowed you to illustrate on a computer screen all the data locked away in those websites or internet files. It was the Netscape browser that brought the internet to life and made it a tool of connectivity that grandma and grandpa and grandson and granddaughter could all use with equal facility. But the second thing that Netscape did, Netscape's going public that morning on August 9th, 1995, was that it triggered the dot-com boom. That stock offering that morning triggered the dot-com boom, and that triggered the dot-com bubble, and that triggered the crazy, absurd, ridiculous, insane, utterly outrageous overinvestment of one trillion dollars in five years into fiber optic cable. And that massive, absurd, ridiculous investment of fiber optic cable under sea and over land accidentally, without anybody planning it, made Beijing, Bangalore, 
and Williamstown, all next door neighbors. It so drove down the price. Remember all those individuals in the first flattener authoring their own content in digital form? Well, thanks to the Netscape moment, those individuals could send their, indivi their, their content anywhere in the world virtually for free. You remember how it happened? Netscape went public on the morning of 8, 9, 95 at 9 a.m. Its investment banker, Morgan Stanley, wanted the stock to be priced at $32. But Jim Barksdale, the Netscape CEO, said, no, no, if this fails, I want it to be remembered as a $20 stock. So Netscape was priced at 9 a.m. when the market opened that morning at $28. It opened at 71 it closed that first day at 56. And we all looked at that and we said, Woo, there is gold over them, their hills. <laughs> and what did we do? We all went out and we bought Lucent. And we bought Nextel. And we bought Global Crossing. And we bought JDS Unify. Oh, you can't fool me. I know it's in your 401ks, OK? <laughs> and when we did, we accidentally funded the massive overwiring of the world with fiber optic cable. And we accidentally enabled every individual authoring their bits and bytes to send them anywhere for free. Now the third revolution, this was a quiet revolution. It had no day. I call it the workflow revolution. It was a revolution in software that made everyone's software interoperable. Now, again, let's go back to Williams, back when Williams first got computers. God, they, they were so excited. The, the, the bookkeeping department got computers. They got rid of the adding machine, the abacus, whatever they had down there. They, they, were, they were so excited. And, and then the admissions department got computers. And it was, it was just great. There, were, there was just one problem. Bookkeeping was running SAP, and admissions was running Microsoft. And they didn't connect. So whenever there was an issue between bookkeeping and admissions, someone from bookkeeping had to walk over with a piece of paper to someone in admissions. Basically, during the 1990s, there was a quiet revolution in software through the invention of some transmission protocols by the alphabet soup of HTML and HTTP and XML and SOAP and AJAX that basically made everyone's software interoperable. And that was a huge revolution. Because when my software can connect with your software, what it meant was that we could suddenly work together. Now put it all together. First I can author my own content in digital form, then I could send it anywhere for free, and then thanks to the workflow revolution, you and I could collaborate on each other's content from anywhere with anyone. Those three together, which came together at the end of the 1990s, were what I would call the genesis moment of the flat world. Because what those three together created was a crude global platform for multiple forms of collaboration. Suddenly on this platform, more people could collaborate with more other people on more different kinds of things, on more different kinds of days, in more different kinds of ways than ever before in the history of the world. And it all came together in the late 1990s. Now the next six flatteners are the six new forms of collaboration that immediately sprung off that platform and flattened the world even more. Let me go through them quickly. The first, of course, is outsourcing. Outsourcing is just a new form of collaboration enabled by that platform. So Williams, if it wants today, can, can basically outsource its bookkeeping department to you know, northern Massachusetts, North Dakota, or North Bangalore. Off this platform, either one is equally easy outsourcing. Second new form of collaboration is offshoring. Offshoring is where I take my whole factory from Canton, Ohio, and move it to Canton, China, and integrate it into my global production chain. Off this platform, offshoring takes a whole new leap forward. Third new form of collaboration, the most revolutionary, I now call uploading. This is a term coined by Kevin Kelly from Wired Magazine. Uploading is going to be hugely revolutionary. See, when the world was round, you downloaded. But when the world is flat, you as an individual can now upload. 
So there are different forms of uploading. The most popular and most well-known, of course, is open source, open source software. A bunch of geeks sitting at home, working in basically online chat rooms, writing the next great operating system, Linux, or the next great web server, Apache. Basically, they aren't waiting to download their software, they're uploading their software. Now, why do they do that? Why do they do that for free? Well, many do it because they hate Microsoft, okay? <laughs> many others do it, though, because they love the pure, peer-reviewed science of it. You, you gotta be a geek to fully appreciate this. Look at this algorithm I came up with. This is so cool. You gotta try this on your computer, you know? I, I come up with this patch. You gotta try this. Well, for whatever reason, what you're seeing is a whole new form of production where people are now uploading their content into products. Now, another form of uploading, when the world was round, if you wanted an opinion on foreign affairs, you had to, you had to download Jim Hoagland or The Post or Fareed Zakaria at Newsweek or Fuddy Duddy like me. When the world is flat, you can, you can upload your own content. It's called blogging. And when I want to know what's going on in Iraq today, the first place I now look to are Iraqi bloggers uploading their own content. Podcasting, another, going to be a monster form of uploading voice and video. And of course, a form of uploading which a lot of the students here are familiar with, but all you gray hairs have no clue about, Wikipedia, where the people are writing their own encyclopedia. They're uploading it. I remember growing up when the Encyclopedia Britannica salesman came to our house with all those books, you know, and that was so exciting. And then, then we, got, we got in Carta with Microsoft Windows. Oh, that was so cool. I got to download my own encyclopedia. You know how many entries there are in Encarta 2006? 36,000 entries. Wow. You know how many entries there are in Wikipedia? The encyclopedia that the people are uploading, writing their own entries, correcting them. It ain't perfect, folks, but it's, it's real. This morning, about 830,000. IBM has concluded, rightly I believe, that more people will now learn about IBM through Wikipedia than any other source. So it has assigned a company officer whose only job is to monitor the IBM entries in Wikipedia. So this is going to be a whole revolutionary new form of collaboration uploading. Fourth new form of collaboration, Kathy alluded to it, I simply call supply chaining. Supply chaining is what Walmart does, only Walmart does it down to the last atom of efficiency. You take an item off a shelf of a Walmart in Massachusetts and another copy of that item is made in Shenzhen, China immediately and sent back up the supply chain. Only as I said, Walmart does it to the last atom of efficiency, and this is a huge flattening force as a result. If Walmart were a country, today it would be China's eighth largest trading partner, ahead of Russia, uh, Australia, uh, and Canada. So this is a huge fat flattening force. Force. The fifth new form of collaboration I call insourcing. Insourcing is what UPS does. You know, those people with the funny brown trucks and the funny brown shorts? If you think all they're doing is delivering packages, you're not paying attention. They do something I call insourcing. They come right into your company, right up to your neck, right up to headquarters, and they take over your entire internal logistics. So say you have a uh, Toshiba laptop, and uh, it breaks one day. You go to the warranty, it says call 1-800-HELP. You call 1-800-HELP, a very lovely voice from India tells you to take your Toshiba laptop to the UPS store, where they'll repair it, and they'll send it back to you in 72 hours. Here's what you don't know. Your Toshiba laptop actually goes from the UPS store to the UPS hub in Louisville Airport in Louisville, Kentucky, where in an airline hangar at Louisville Airport, a UPS employee in funny brown shorts repairs your Toshiba laptop. It never touches Toshiba's hands. They are not interested in your computer. They have insourced all of that to UPS. Now you go to Nike.com, get the kids a new pair of sneakers. Guess who's on the other side of the screen? It's a UPS employee. They're taking down your order. They're picking and packing the shoes from the UPS Nike warehouse they manage. They're shipping them. They're collecting the money. The, you, Nike's insourced all of that to, to UPS. See the Papa John's pizza truck go by? Guess who's driving? 
someone in funny brown shorts. Because Papa John's Pizza has insourced the delivery of their dough from their outlets, bakery, bakery outlets to their stores to UPS. So this is a huge flattening force, it requires a lot of standardization. That's the fifth flattener. Sixth new form of collaboration I call simply informing. Informing is what Google does. I can now inform myself as an individual to a depth and breadth unknown in the history of the world. So just to recap, we got the first three, they create this platform for collaboration. Then we got the six new forms of collaboration, uh, outsourcing, offshoring, uh, uploading, supply chaining, insourcing, and informing. That's nine. I said there were 10. The 10th I simply call the steroids. And the steroids for me are wireless technology, voice over the internet, and file sharing. And what these steroids are doing is turbocharging all these other forms of collaboration, all these new forms of collaboration. So now I can do anyone from anywhere with any device, totally mobily. Those, I argue, are the 10 days that flatten the world. Now, just to tie all this up, this first part of the lecture, um, basically the world got flat right around the year 2000 when several forces converged. The first convergence was that all 10 of these flatteners I've just described, they all started to blend into each other. And the complementarities between them all started to work together at a tipping point. The informing helped the outsourcing, the outsourcing helped the offshoring, the offshoring helped the uploading, and they all started to meld together into what I would call a platform. They all melded together into a global web-enabled platform for multiple forms of sharing knowledge, work, education, and innovation, and unfortunately, also terrorism. And it is this platform the creation of this global web-enabled platform that more people than ever before can now plug and play, compete, connect, and collaborate on, that I mean when I say the world is flat. That we have created a global web-enabled platform for multiple forms of sharing knowledge, work, entertainment, innovation, and unfortunately, also terrorism. It is that platform that I think is going to be at the center of our world going forward. We're basically going from a world of vertical, a world where value is created in vertical silos of command and control, to a world where value will increasingly be created by who you connect and collaborate with horizontally. We're going from vertical to horizontal models of creativity and collaboration. I believe that move from vertical to horizontal is going to change everything. I believe in time it will be recognized as a as the mother of all inflection points. Um, it will be seen in time as a move as important in shaping our lives as Gutenberg's invention of the, of the printing press. Because on this platform, on this platform, there's only one rule. Whatever can be done, will be done. Whatever can be done, whatever this technology empowers and enables, will be done by someone in a flat world. There's only one question, will it be done by you or to you? But trust me, on this platform, whatever can be done will be done, and there are now so many more people who can make sure that is the case. That was the first, I would say, convergence. Second big convergence is that we're now all learning, as, as students, as teachers, as, as workers, as employers, as entrepreneurs, to change our habits to go from a vertical to horizontal world. We're all learning to what I would call horizontalize ourselves. Now, once we do, we're going to get the full productivity boost out of this new platform. But we're just now learning these new habits. Economists have studied this phenomenon before. Paul David, the famous Stanford economist, did a study of electrification. And he asked an interesting question. Why was it when electricity first came out that we didn't get a huge productivity boost? And when he studied it, he realized it was because, first of all, we had to completely redesign buildings to go from tall, multi-story structures that could accommodate steam pulleys to low-slung low factories that could operate with small electric motors along the, along the production line. And then we had to change how workers worked and how managers managed and how consultants consulted. And only when we made all those changes around electricity, only then did we get this huge productivity boost. We're in the middle of a similar transition, I would argue, around horizontalization. 
And I actually, I actually discovered this on my own quite by accident. Um, our, our oldest daughter goes to school in New Haven, Connecticut. We live in Bethesda, Maryland. To get from Bethesda, Maryland to New Haven, Connecticut is a complete pain in the behind. You have to drive 50 minutes from Bethesda to Baltimore Airport, then take Southwest Airlines from Baltimore to Hartford, and then drive for at least an hour from Hartford to New Haven. No problem, I'm a fan of Southwest. I really don't know many of you have flown Southwest, but as you know, it's El Cheapo Airline, and on Southwest Airlines, you don't get a reserved seat. You just get a ticket that says A, B, or C. A's board first, B's board second, C's board last. There's only one thing you need to know about Southwest Airlines. You do not want to be a C, okay? <laughs> and you don't even want to be a B if you're carrying two bags of spring clothes for your daughter and you want to have room above the seat when you get on the plane and not get stuck in the middle. No problem, I'm a try to be a hip guy, so I did the e-ticket thing ahead of time, you know, but just in case, I got to Baltimore Airport 95 minutes before the flight because I was going to be an A, and uh, took out my visa card, stuck it in the Southwest e-ticket machine, and out came my ticket, and it said B. And I said, son of a, this thing is fixed, this is rigged, this is worse than Las Vegas, there is no way I'm a B. I'm here 95 minutes before this flight, there is no way I'm a B. Ooh, I was mad. I went and got my Cinnabon and sat in the back of the beeline, <laughs> stewing, you know. Well, 45 minutes went by, and then I saw it. They called the flight, and all, all the A's seemed to be getting on, carrying what, what looked to me like just crumpled white home printer paper, as though they had gone online at 12.01 a.m. the night before and downloaded and printed out their own barcodes and boarding passes and taken up all the A seats. Well, of course, what I didn't know was Southwest Airlines taking advantage of this new platform. This convergence of the 10 flatteners had just begun a program where any, any customer could go online the night before and download and print out, as an individual, their own barcode and boarding pass. Oh, I looked at that, friends. I said, Friedman, you are so 20th century, really. <laughs> you are so Globalization 2.0. I mean, think about it. In Globalization 1.0, there was a ticket agent. I used to go down to K Street, pull a number, stand in line. Thank you very much, ma'am. You know, take about a half hour. Then Globalization 2.0, we got the e-ticket machine. We thought that was cool. While you were sleeping, while you were sleeping, you, the individual, became your own ticket agent. Or look at it another way. You, the individual, became an employee of Southwest Airlines. <laughs> or to look at it one more way, if you happen to value your own time, staying up at 12.01 a.m. the night before, you, the individual, are now paying Southwest Airlines to be their employee. <laughs> Have a nice day. <laughs> okay. So, basically, next time around, friends, I will horizontalize myself. I will get up at 12.01 a.m. the night before. I will download and print out. You don't have to do it anymore, even stay up till 12.01 a.m. Download and print out my own barcode and boarding pass. And when I do, I will get to BWI Airport 35 minutes before my flight. And when I do, I will capture 60 minutes of productivity. I will have horizontalized myself. I will go from interacting with Southwest Airlines vertically to interacting with them horizontally. The third great convergence that sort of brought all this together is, of course, is that just when we created this new platform, just when we created these new habits, guess what happened? Russia, India, and China opened themselves to the world, and three billion new players, who were really out of the game in many ways, walked onto the playing field. And when did they arrive? Just when it had been flattened. Just when their people could plug and play, compete, connect, and collaborate with your kids and mine more cheaply, more easily, more effectively than any time in the history of the world. It's the simple argument of this book that it's these three flatteners, basically, these three convergences, excuse me, that really have created this flat world that we're in right now. Now let me just point out one thing that disguised all of this. This, as I say, I believe is going to be seen in time as a huge inflection point, but it was completely disguised by 9-11, Enron, and the dot-com bust. 9-11, 
completely distracted us from the certainly columnists right up to the president. Enron made every CEO guilty until proven innocent, so who wanted to talk to them? And the dot-com bust really made people stupid. It made them think globalization was over, when in fact it was just getting turbocharged. So I have to tell you, doing this book was, it was a little bit like being in a science fiction movie. Because I would go around and interview uh, all these CEOs and CIOs and CTOs, and, and they all knew the secret. They were like pod people. They all knew what was going on, and they were doing it like crazy, and they broke the code for me. But nobody told the kids. Nobody told the kids. That is, nobody was talking about it. Nobody was talking about it at the political level. Nobody was talking about what is the new, new deal we now need to have as a society to basically get the most out of it and protect ourselves from the worst of this flattening world. So we just had an election where the Democrats were debating whether NAFTA is a good idea, and the Republicans put duct tape over the mouth of Chief White House economist Greg Mankiw when he said outsourcing makes sense, and they stashed him in Dick Cheney's basement. <laughs> Never to be heard from again. Has anybody seen poor Greg Mankiw? So right when we reach this incredible inflection point, no one was talking about it. So I wrote this book very simply so that at least two kids, mine, <laughs> were going to know what, what world they're growing up in. And it's a world, as I've said many times, where when I grew up in Minnesota in the 1950s, my parents used to say to me, Tom, finish your dinner. Don't you understand? People in China and India are starving. And I tell my girls, girls, finish your homework, because people in China and India are starving for your jobs. <laughs> and in a flat world, they can have them. Because more and more in a flat world, there is going to be no such thing as an American job. There is just going to be a job that will go to the most productive worker, wherever he or she might be. Now, what is this world going to mean for education, for, for all these young people? Um, that's something I've really been trying to think about a lot in the 2.0 version of this book. Now, what I've basically argued is that when the world is flat, everyone should want to be an untouchable. That's right, the global caste system gets turned upside down in a flat world. The untouchables become the highest caste. And untouchables in my lexicon are people whose jobs cannot be, cannot be outsourced, automated, or digitized. Now, I would argue there's sort of three broad categories of, of jobs that, in this flat world. First are people who are really special or specialized. They can't be outsourced, automated, or digitized. Barbara Streisand, Michael jo Jordan, J.K. Rowling, your brain surgeon, they don't have to worry. They are special or specialized enough, they're never going they are untouchables. Second are people who are local and, lo and anchored. They're also untouchables. Your butcher, your baker, your candlestick maker, the nurse, the nanny, um, your divorce lawyer, God forbid, all these people who have to do a specific job in a specific place face to face. But in between, in between are a whole set of middle class jobs that will increasingly be subject in part or entirely to these forces of flattening, competition, outsourcing, and automation. So what I've tried to think about is, well, if those are the old middle jobs, what will the new middle jobs <coughs> that will not be subject so much to those forces. And this is an important political question, because if we go from a, a, a bell jar middle class, where we have a big, fat middle class, small at the top, small at the bottom, to a barbell economy, you know, sort of big at the top, huge at the bottom, and not much in the middle, that will have huge political ramifications for our democracy. So this may sound like an economic or a jobs question, but for me at heart, it's a political question. Now, I've come up with what I call the eight job categories of, of, of the new middle. Um, and these are not specific jobs. It's not like, you know, software engineer for Novell Networks. It's, they're broad categories, but I think it'll give you an idea of what I think will be the job categories of the new middle. And what I basically did this last year was, first of all, try to understand what are those jobs, then ask the question, what is the right education for those jobs? And then ask the question, who, where are people giving that kind of education? So let me talk about these quickly, these eight categories. Um, first category I call great collaborators. Great collaborators, because in a world where more and more 
knowledge work, service work, and manufacturing will be done as part of global supply chains. There's going to be a huge amount of work around collaboration and coordination. I first actually started thinking about this. Last summer, I, I took my daughter to India. Um, uh, she, was, she was working in a village school out of Bang outside of Bangalore, and I wanted her to, before we went there, to see Infosys, where the book had started, this Indian high-tech company. And the Infosys spokeswoman was taking us around the Infosys campus, and along the way, she said, um, Mr. Friedman, our interns heard you were here, and they wondered if you'd come speak to them. And I said, that is so sweet. Um, I, I'd love to speak to your Indian intern. No, no, she said, our American interns. <laughs> I said, you have American interns at Infosys? She said, yes, we had 9,000 applications last year um, from China, Europe, and the United States. I said, I gotta meet these kids. Well, it turned out they were, in this case, all engineering or MBA students who understood that their first job out of engineering or MBA school might be um, deputy assistant manager of India supply chain for, for Target um, or for an engineering company. If they could show they had experience as collaborators, the language experience, the real hands-on experience of working with other people abroad as part of a knowledge supply chain or a global supply chain, they would have a leg up. So great collaborators. Second category are great leveragers. These are people who can leverage technology so one person can do the job of 20 as opposed to 20 people doing the job of one. And after all, that is the key to keeping up the standard of living of our middle class. Because if we can leverage technology at such a high rate of productivity, we can, can, can continue to pay people decent and good wages. So leveraging technology. I can go into detail on any of these later. The third, third category are great synthesizers. Great synthesis. People who can take A and B and produce C. There's going to be a huge amount of work in and around that because in a flat world, there are so many more A's and so many more B's to put together into so many more kinds of C's. Now, the most obvious example of synthesis is one that has become central to our lives. It's the Apple iPod. I mean, what is the iPod? What, is, what was Steve Jobs' genius? He took something that was readily out there already, the MP3 player, and he melded it with an online music store. He put A together with B and produced C, the iPod revolution. And so the ability to connect dots like that and to think in that way, to be a synthesizer or work as part of synthetic organizations like synthesizing organizations like that, going to be a huge amount of new middle work. Fourth category I call great localizers. Localizers are people who can take the power of this global platform and create a local small business around it. So that can be anything from the eBay entrepreneur, people who use the eBay platform to run local businesses out of their basements or garages. It can be the garage owner here in, in Williamstown who um, goes online and says to his partner one day, hey Louie, look, we can get our hubcabs for half price on the internet from Romania instead of Rochester. Um, it's the sports bar owner who understands that um, basically with direct satellite TV now, they can have 50 flat screen TVs in their sports bar. They can show lacrosse, soccer, hockey, you know, women's basketball from anywhere in the world. They're taking the power of this global platform, but using their imagination to create a local small business around it. And it's small business and medium business that really drives employment. Fifth category I call passionate personalizers. People who can bring a personal, passionate touch to any vanilla task. And I build this around a guy who sells lemonade at Baltimore Orioles Stadium, Camden Yards. Our family, we, we've been sharing season tickets to Orioles games for many years. There's a guy who's sitting now lemonade at Camden Yards, I should say, consists of a plastic cup with water, sugar, and a lemon floating in. It doesn't get any more vanilla than that. But this one vendor, he doesn't just sell lemonade, lemonade. No, he shakes it, he does a jig, he does a dance, he stands on his hand, he high fives you, he sings a song, whatever. I always notice at the end of the game, he's got a wad of tips, 10 times thicker than anyone in the stadium. Because he took a vanilla task and he put a passionate, personal touch on it. And the best part was, a week ago today, I was at the Orioles home game. Sorry, opening day. And the people I was with, I was actually telling them this story that I profiled this guy, I sort of had my eye out for him. They said, no, no, no. He now rents himself out for private parties. <laughs> okay. 
is this a great country or what? Okay. <laughs> but he is someone who put a passionate personal touch on a vanilla task, and if you can do that, there's a new middle job for you out there. Uh, sixth category is anything green. Anything green, because basically, as I'll talk about in a minute, um, in this flat world, when three billion new consumers walk onto the flat world, all with their own versions of the American dream, a house, a car, a toaster, a microwave, and a refrigerator, if we don't find an alternative to fossil fuels, and fast, to provide the energy needs of all these new aspirants, and God bless them, <coughs> We are going to burn up, choke up, heat up, and smoke up this planet so much faster than ever before in the history of the world. And therefore, mom, dad, tell your kids, anything green is going to have a new middle job around it. Green design, green manufacturing, green services, green consulting is going to be the industry of the 21st century. Uh, seventh category, this is my hope for survival in the new middle, great explainers. Because um, when the world gets this complex, the ability of a great teacher, great professor, a great middle manager, a great senior manager, hopefully good journalist who can explain this complexity and model it, there is going to be a huge amount of work around explaining and modeling this complexity so people can understand it, grasp it, and exploit it. Last category I simply call great adapters, people who understand that um, you've got to constantly be adapting in order to survive in this marketplace. I build this category around a woman, Marsha Lockery at EDS Systems. I met down in Plano, Texas, Ross Brozol company, big computer company. And uh, Marsha Lockery, she understood something about the marketplace. It's, a, it's an insight that I first heard from Gene Sperling, President Clinton's old economic advisor. He said, the way these young people today have to prepare for the marketplace, it, it's, it's really it's sort of like training for the Olympics. But with one difference, you don't know what sport you're going to enter. You've got to be a versatilist, really, really adaptable. Now, Marsha Locke restarted at EDS Systems in the typing pool. Today, she's a systems engineer there. Every job she has had at EDS Systems has been outsourced, digitized, or automated. She just stayed one step ahead of the Pac-Man by constantly adapting. Today she's a systems engineer and she does not have her BA. She's been too busy adapting. So those are my, my sort of just very, very quick you know, summary thoughts about education, um, about the jobs. Let me just say quickly, what does that mean for education? I think it means um, several things. One thing it means is that teaching kids to learn how to learn is the most important thing we can teach them whether it's K through 12 or at Williams College. Because it's not what you know, it's how you learn. Because what you know today, probably gonna to be outdated a lot faster in a flat world. And it is the ability to learn how to learn, which is the most important educational tool that any elementary school, high school, or university, I think, can impart to someone going out into the job market today. So I was actually given this talk in, uh, St. Paul um, and a ninth grader stood up in the balcony, a young man in the question time, he identified himself as a ninth grader, and he said, Mr. Friedman, I, I just have one question. What course do I take to learn how to learn? <laughs> From the mouths of babes, you know, it was just, and I hadn't really thought about it, and I, you know, but I've thought about it a lot since, and standing on one leg, though, I did tell him this. I said, you know, young man, my advice to you would be this. Um, go around to your friends and ask them, Who, who's your favorite teacher? Who's your favorite teacher? And make a list and take all their courses. Because the first way you learn how to learn is, is to love how to learn. And one of the ways, one of the most important ways you learn that is from great teachers. Take their courses no matter what they're teaching. Greek mythology, archeology, span trigonometry, Russian literature, it doesn't matter. I don't remember a lot anymore what my favorite teacher has taught me, but I sure remember loving to learn it. Second thing I really focus on is um, a mathematical formula that I've, I've, I've been working on. It goes like this, that CQ plus PQ in a flat world is always greater than IQ. Give me a young person, a young girl, a young boy with a high CQ, high curiosity quotient, and a high PQ, a high passion quotient in a flat world in a world of Google and the internet, man, I'll take them over a kid with a high IQ seven days a week 
365 days of the year. Doc Searle said it so well, no one learns better than a curious kid. And in a flat world, a kid with a high CQ and a high PQ has so many more tools to teach and motivate and discover themselves. And so, again, how you stimulate that CQ, that, that PQ, that, that's beyond me. I, I don't really know, but, you know, I, I talked about at graduation last year. I did what I loved, and, and that was my PQ. And, um, you know, sometimes I think we should all think back to that moment. Morty and I were talking about it over dinner and how many more students here are studying economics and, and whether they're really studying it because they have a PQ for it or whether because um, they think that's what the job market, you know, really is demanding. And I, I was thinking about it that what is, what is that PQ? How do you get back in touch with your PQ? A lot of people ask me that. And, you know, my advice is try to think back of the excitement that you had when when you got your first astronaut outfit, your first doctor's kit, uh, your first building set, um, your first fire truck, that kind of unalloyed, I want to be that, you know. That's where that PQ sits. You, you got to rediscover your inner fire truck, you know. And um, there's a, there's a inner, we all have an inner fire truck somewhere. And um, your PQ is sitting somewhere around there, I would guess. So always remember, CQ plus PQ is greater than IQ. Last point is a point made by Dan Pink in a book called A Whole New Mind. Um, but Dan basically argues, you got your left brain, you got your right brain. Left brain, you know, repetitive function, not very interesting, rote, automated, mass production, SATs, left side of your brain. Uh, right brain, um, synthetic dot connecting, empathetic, storytelling, synthesizing. Basically what Dan argues, when the world is flat, everything on the left side of your brain is going to be done by a computer faster or an Indian cheaper. Okay? <laughs> um, and it's a right brain world. And therefore how schools nurture those right brain skills and all three of these things are related, I think is going to be the real challenge of education. Last, let me simply conclude. Um, with where I've been going lately in my column and my own work, and that is around this issue of, uh, of energy, um, energy slash environment, which I consider today to be the most strategic, uh, the important question uh, in our world, um, uh, and certainly in, in the world that I inhabit of uh, foreign affairs. Basically, what's happened in the world is that we've moved from a world of 20 to $40 a barrel oil to a world of 40 to 60 or more a dollar barrel oil. And as a result of that move, the situation we're in right now, which I don't believe our government has in any way begun to comprehend, the only way I can describe it is that this is not your grandparents' energy crisis. This is not your grandparents' energy crisis. Because of the flat world, we are in a whole new energy environment. To begin with, we're now in a war with people who in many cases are fueled and funded by our energy purchases. We are basically funding both sides in the war on terrorism. We fund the US Army, Navy, and Air Force with our tax dollars. We fund Al Qaeda and Islamic Jihad and Hamas and Iran through our energy purchases. That's not real smart. We are funding both sides in the war on terrorism. Second, as I said earlier, <clears throat> when the world is flat and three billion new players come onto this field, if we don't find an alternative very, very soon, I believe you are gonna see global warming so much faster in this flat world. The flat world is going to bring on global warming so much faster if we do not get ourselves onto alternatives to fossil fuels. And that relates to the third point, again, to which I alluded to earlier, that green technology is going to be the industry of the 21st century. Now, China is going to go green. I just returned from China a couple months ago. I did seven columns on on basically the challenge that green China is going to pose, is going to pose more than red China. China is going to go green, not because they've read me or Rachel Carson. China is going to go green because China can't breathe. 
China is growing at 10% and giving back at least 2% right now of growth every year in lost work days, ill health, polluted rivers, and destroyed environment. So China will go green, and China will go green around low-cost, scalable green technologies. If they're not low-cost, they won't scale in China, and if they don't scale, they won't have an impact. China is going to take on the great industry of the 21st century. And what are we doing? What are we doing? We're telling General Motors, oh, no, no, don't, don't, don't improve your mileage standards. We, we wouldn't want to impose anything hard on you. Well, you know, 20 years of doing that has brought you General Motors of today. The General Motors that, as they said in Marketplace the other day, is selling, selling everything but cars. Selling its finance unit, it's selling its factories, you know. General Motors today, do you all realize that Harley Davidson, the motorcycle company, is worth more today than General Motors? And that, by, by a significant amount, I should say. And that is the product of a series of governments and congresses saying, oh, we, we wouldn't want to impose anything hard on you. Well, as a result of that kind of attitude, we are condemning our industries. When we lower and weaken our environmental standards, we are actually condemning our industries to lose in what is going to be the great green technology race of the 21st century. But, but the last category is the one that worries me most. Basically, we thought with the fall of the Berlin Wall, we thought that with the fall of the Berlin Wall, we were unleashing an unstoppable tide of free markets and free people. And for about a decade, it looked that way. But as the flat world and all these new consumers moved us from a world of $40 a barrel oil to $60 a barrel oil, what's happening is what we thought was an unstoppable tide of free markets and free people is now running, is now running into a black tide of petro-authoritarianism. There are a whole group of petro-authoritarian states today called Russia, Iran, Venezuela, Nigeria, you can go right down the list, who now have more money than ever before to do more mischief. And they are collectively actually becoming a counter-tide, what I call a petro-authoritarian tide, to what we thought was going to be an unstoppable wave of free markets and free people. It's because of all four of those things what I've been trying to argue is that this energy question is not your grandparents' energy crisis. This has created a whole new strategic challenge that we need to face up to. And there is nothing that makes me angrier than the patronizing um, attitude of big oil and their advocates, who, when I make this point, sort of pat you on the head and say, oh, Tom, what you don't understand is we're going to have to be dependent on fossil fuels for a long, long time. This is the essence of Cheneyism. And to me, this is what I call the old realism. It masquerades as a kind of realism, but it's actually, it's actually old realism. It's actually so pre-9-11. The new realism, the new realism is understanding this new strategic environment requires us to think about energy, environment, and conservation in a wholly new way. You know, I've always said to name something is to own it. And unfortunately, big oil and its spokespeople have named for so many years conservation, environmentalism, and green technology. And they named it liberal, tree-hugging, girly man, wimpy, Vaguely French, okay? <laughs> well, if, if I leave you with one thought tonight, my friends, it's this. That green is the most geostrategic, geoeconomic, capitalistic, patriotic thing we can be today. Green, my friends, is the new red, white, and blue. Thank you very much.
Thank you. The floor is open and the mic is there waiting for five students. <laughs> I think the mic's right there in the middle, if anybody. Yeah, please go right ahead. Is this on? Yeah. OK. Um, I'm Henderson Shorter from United Nations International School. Mm -hmm. That's in New York. Uh -huh. Edgar Williams. You don't go, to, you don't, you don't go uh, here? Not yet, at least. Not yet, OK. I'm not sure. Um, we'll first of all, I want to say that you're your complete argument is a really hot topic in my economics class. Oh, thank you. Appreciate so, it. So, we really respect you back at Eunice. Thank you. <laughs> thank um, you. But my main point is, Please. we all know that shareholders are the major, um, I'm sorry, the major advocates of continuing this per, um, sorry, this, what am I saying? This binge on mm -hmm. fossil fuels. Uh -huh. That's fueling the, uh, this entire epidemic of, right this, the death of our um, earth. So what I'm asking is, how can we advocate these shareholders, these individuals, yeah. who, are har who are becoming more horizontally right. integrated into this, right. into this world? How can we advocate them to change, to be green yes. instead of black? That's good. Um, thank you. It's, um, you know, you, you, I think you touched on the right mechanism, which is, um, uh, using the flat world to do that. You know, it's interesting if you look at Walmart right now, um, what's been going on around Walmart, which is that, um, look, Walmart is a big, tough, mean company, and, um, but it lives in a flat world. And basically, um, from shareholders and just public opinion on the flat world platform, there's a huge amount of blogs, for instance, around Walmart today. They've gotten the message. Walmart has teamed up with Conservation International now to transform their truck fleet, um, and to transform their supply chain around much greener standards. They're not there yet. I am in a uh, show me mode. Um, before, you know, I would write about this, you know, as a huge transformation, but if they do, you know, one of the things I learned covering the Arab-Israeli conflict for so many years is that the way you often get big change is when you get the big players to do the right thing for the wrong reasons. If you wait for everyone to do the right thing for the right reasons, sometimes you wait forever. So if you can get a big player like Walmart, because it's worried about its image, and its image is being sullied in this flat world farther and faster than ever before, to change its green practices, um, <clears throat> then, then you can have a big effect. I have wondered, though, and I'm so glad you raised this, because it has surprised me that students aren't more active you know, around this issue. Like, I think if I were on this campus, I would make it a no-hummer zone. I have a simple rule in life. You want to drive a Hummer? Go to Iraq. Okay? Not on my, not on my campus. Okay. You know, so, you know, you know, one of those, any, any car that drives from gas station to gas station, you know, basically, which is all it does, you know, get one of those signs. You have a nice Hummer picture with a big red circle and a line through it, you know. But, we all got to do our part, you know, whether it's buying a Prius or thinking. But somebody told me you've got a, I heard someone talking today about a program of, of studying in the dark or something going on here. Or, um, <laughs> is that like a, is that like a thing I shouldn't be talking about from up here? <laughs> on, on, but, but anyways, you know, understand, I and mean, this is, you know, one of the points I just so try to convey to people, you know, about this flat world. It, it can be incredibly authoritarian, but it can be incredibly democratizing. It can be incredibly homogenizing and incredibly particularizing. It's what you do about it. But you as an individual have more power to upload than ever before. And you got, we all got to use it. So thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, you mentioned Hi. that <clears throat> we are fighting with, that we're funding both sides right. in the war on terror. I was wondering, couldn't you say the same exact thing about the war on drugs, considering mm. that our government yeah. spends billions of dollars to destroy plants and then at the same time makes those plants worth billions of dollars right. by banning them. I, I, people have made that point to me. I think it's a very good point and I, I thank you for making it. I, I would have anything to elaborate, but I think, you're, I think you're right. I don't know much about the war on drugs, unfortunately, but from everything I've heard, 
I think you're exactly right. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah. <coughs> Hi, my name is Irene Kale. I'm Hi. I'm a high school senior from Virginia. Huh. And I love your book. Thank I bought you. it. Oh. I bought it at Walmart. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not so bad. I mean, <laughs> and I'm Chinese myself, so I've been following a lot of recent develops, uh, a lot of the recent development with China. And I read in your book that mm -hmm. one of the major reasons for the collapse of the Soviet Union was that they could not keep their monopoly on information, mm -hmm. especially with technology today right. and people informing themselves, like you said. Right. And with the recent crackdown of Chinese bloggers and right. people who have been informing yourself, I was wondering also because China has so much economic growth and potential. Yes. And so far, it's only it's been a climb uphill. Right. I was wondering if what would be the breaking point between hmm. China China's economic growth and, and politics and politics. Yes, it's a very very good question, and and let me let me try to answer it in a in a couple of ways. Um, first, by way of comparison, you know, I often, whenever I'm in China, people ask me about India. What do you think about India? <laughs> and whenever I'm in India, people ask me, what do you think about China? And um, so I kind of developed, you know, this answer. I said, you know, I would say China and India to me are like two six-lane superhighways, big highways, you know. And um, the Chinese superhighway, perfectly paved, nice, neat lanes, sidewalks, street lights. Everybody's going 80 miles an hour. There's just one problem. Off in the distance, there's a speed bump called political reform, the point you're talking about. And when 1.3 billion people going 80 miles an hour hit a speed bump, one of two things happens. The car jumps up in the air, slams down. Everyone says, you okay? You okay? I'm okay. Drives on. <laughs> the other thing that happens is all the wheels fall off. What we don't know about China is which one of those things is going to happen. Now, I come from the school that hopes and prays that it's the first. Because I think the, mom the moment you're talking about is a moment that is hugely important for the whole world. How China meets that speed bump and what happens on the other side will affect everything from the air we breathe to the cost of the clothes and food that we consume to the value of our currency. So I personally wish them well, and I do not, um, I'm not part of this school that believes we are inevitably going to clash and be in a Cold War with China. Now the Indian superhighway, also six lanes, full of potholes, cracks, cement, half the sidewalks aren't finished, and most of the street lamps are out. But off in the distance, it looks like it smooths out into a perfect six-lane superhighway. The question with India is, is that the mirage or is that the real thing? And so both these two giants have these big question marks that you, you know, identify. I don't know when that junction will be. But, you know, I looked at the Google thing, the whole censoring of Google <laughs> by China. And um, I, had, I had sort of multiple reactions. One was shame on Microsoft, Google and Yahoo for, for giving in, for kowtowing on this issue, you know. That was my, my first re reaction. Um, my second reaction, though, was, um, was shame on China, you know, um, uh, for doing this. My third reaction, though, was, well, you know, maybe I can't search for Falun Gong or Tiananmen Square, but I can search for Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin in Chinese still. And isn't that what we should really focus on? But fourthly, my reaction is, this is just an intuition. But I actually think this is the end of something, not the beginning of something. I think this is the last gasp of a security apparatus propelled by the utterly fool's errand notion that they can control the internet. Good luck. Thank okay, you, I don't Griffin. think so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you have
have been talking about this process of um, horizontalization, and I was wondering, and it's something you have not touched upon. Yes. Is this meant also equalization? Mm -hmm. Good I, question. I know that your like yeah. focus is on in the, the individuals, but I was wondering, right. like in the relationship between like the third world and the first world. Absolutely, it's a good question. Thank you for asking that. Actually, the answer is no. That when I say the world is flat, I do not in any way mean that it's equal. What I mean is that. If I had been truly accurate, if I had had to get tenure at Williams, okay, <laughs> I would have called my book The World is Flattening, okay? But obviously, because uh, I know, as I say in the book, the world is not flat. It's really, I happen to think this flattening process, though, is the most important thing going on. Um, there are many, many parts of the world. Um, so it is not um, flat in the sense of being equal, but it is flat in the sense of more people than ever before have the individual power to connect with this platform and, and uh, both collaborate on it and innovate on it and do all these things. Um, what is, let me try to answer your very important question with, with a criticism that's often leveled at me. And it sort of goes like this. Um, Friedman goes to India. Um, he meets with his high-tech pals. And um, uh, what he doesn't understand is there are poor people in India. Well, my first reaction is, thank you, you know, for telling me there are poor people in India. I wouldn't have noticed otherwise, you know, I mean. Um, but, but more importantly, you're the one, I would say to the critic, not to you, um, that's really missing the point. Because it is true, you know, if you go to Bangalore today, say, the um, well, first time I went to Bangalore, you went 15 minutes out of the city center, you were back 15 centuries. Today, you got to go an hour out of the city center to get back 15 centuries. So why is that important? That you have to not, if you just take a snapshot of India today, well, it'll be depressing in some ways, in many ways. You've got to look at the scope and the scale and the pace of change. India in 1991 had $100 million in foreign reserves. It was basically going bankrupt, if one can speak of a country going bankrupt. 100 billion, sorry, 1 billion people with $100 million in foreign reserves. Today, because of this new strategy of globalizing, India has $140 billion in foreign reserves. And if you look at the latest Indian budget, what do you see? 30% increase in health spending, 30% increase in rural development, rural education spending. But the most important thing about those numbers is those are Indian-generated rupees. They didn't come from the World Bank. They didn't come from a Live Aid concert. They didn't come from the IMF. What is old is that there are poor people in India. That is as old as millennia. What is new is that India, for the first time, has an Indian engine for making Indians unpoor. It won't happen overnight, but that is really new, and what happens because of that engine, it's true, only 1% of Indians are involved in the high-tech industry. But you know what? The other 99 really have gotten a huge buzz off that 1%. It's given them a sense of self-confidence, a sense of opportunity, a sense of optimism. That's why when you go to India, you want to know what India's like today? I always tell people, just go out, buy a bottle of champagne, shake it for 30 minutes, take off the cork. That's what India is like today. You don't want to get in the way of that cork. Okay, so don't take a snapshot. If you take a snapshot, because change doesn't happen like that. What is new, and this is what people, whether from you know, Latin America or from India or from China, need to focus on. Are you developing your own internal engines you know, to make your people unpoor? And also to set an example that affects a whole bunch of other people. Last point. I got two interesting phone calls last week. One was from the head of Satyam. Satyam is one of the big Indian high-tech companies. Um, and the president, who knows I'm interested in this kind of story, said, I think you might be interested in this. We just started outsourcing to Indian villages. So what happens is GE outsources to Satyam. Satyam strips certain of those functions down to very routine functions. And the outsourcee now becomes the outsourcer and is outsourcing work now to Indian villages. They've started with two. They have plans to go up to 150. Second phone call was from Google. Google, for those of you Google fans know, Google just started Google Finance, which
which parallels Google News. Big website, track your portfolio, finance, everything. They called to tell me the story. We had a conference call between Bangalore and, and Mountain View, California, that Google Finance was completely invented in Bangalore. And they sold it to the people in Mountain View. So don't take a snapshot. Look at this trajectory of change. Thank you. Thank you. So I was under the impression that part of the reason that China and India and other countries have this competitive advantage is that they have lower environmental and safety standards, lower wages, fewer benefits. And so my question is, will other developing countries avoid implementing these you know, benefits in the future because they need to gain that competitive advantage? And will countries like the US roll back their standards that they've had right. on the books for 20, good, 30 years? It's a good question. But always remember, you know, work, good work, goes to the most productive worker, not to the cheapest. If, if work just went to the cheapest, most environmentally lax country, Haiti today would be a country of full employment. Okay, Bangladesh would be bursting with jobs. Um, yes, you can cut corners at a certain point, you know, to get that work, but basically, if you don't keep your standards moving up, you're not going to you're not going to be able to do it very productively. People who work in sweatshops under terrible conditions, both environmental and physical, over time, they're not going to be very productive workers. Yeah, they can they can hold it, but those are jobs that move from Bangladesh to Haiti to you know, to, from one troubled, you know, low-income place to another, you will never move up the ladder. So, you know, I don't think we should or will be going there. Uh, I think that's really the wrong way to go. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I was just in Peru, uh -huh. um, the Peruvian Amazon, with an alumni trip. Cool. I'm going there in a few, few weeks. It was mm -hmm. amazing. Good. <laughs> You'll have fun. Good. Um, and uh, we were deep, deep, deep in the jungle, and I saw a three-year-old girl wearing an Incredibles t-shirt. Huh. And I know Pixar could have outsourced India, and an Indian could have designed that shirt, but um, the, w the face of globalization has always been considered Western. Right. Um, with this whole idea now of the, global, of the world being flat, what are your predictions for the cultural re repercussions? Um, That's a really will, good question. Will it, it will still be a Western kind yeah. of world? It's a really, bless your heart for asking. Okay. Because um, I added a whole chapter in the new version of the book. Um, <laughs> did I mention I have a new book coming out? <laughs> okay. um, on just that question. It's funny, after the first version, a lot of people asked me that, and I didn't have a good answer. So I, I've added a chapter, and I, I have a you know, sort of background of thinking about this, because when I wrote Lexus in the Olive Tree, um, I really feared that um, globalization was going to be Americanization. And I actually wrote a whole chapter on it, which was called Demolition Man. And it was, that's, it was the title of one of the worst movies ever made, a <laughs> Sylvester Stallone, Wesley Snipes movie, actually about the world in the year 2040, and every restaurant is a Taco Bell, okay? <laughs> and, um, uh, but I did worry about it, and with good reason, because after all, when the walls came down, we, we, America, were the most poised to take advantage. So therefore, it was American styles, American food, American music, American um, movies that were most immediately globalized. And that did produce a backlash. And a legitimate one, because people said, whoa, w wait a minute. We're, you know, if I don't have a robust culture, you know, I'm just going to get blown over by this American tide. So people thought globalization was going to be Americanization. And that was certainly where I was at. You know, almost a decade later, I don't think that anymore. Um, I think what you're actually going to start to see is a, it was expressed by an uh, Indian um, communications specialist, Indrajit Banerjee. He, he calls it the globalization of the local. Instead of American globalization being Americanization, what you're now starting to see is the globalization of the local. It's the ability of localities, thanks to blogging or podcasting or the internet, to take their local and upload it and to globalize it. And I think we're just at the beginning of this. But I think the net result of the flat world is not going to be more homogenization, 
but more particularization when it comes to culture. There is another side of this story, though, and that is that there is a part of globalization that is just modernization, you know. It has nothing to do with culture, per se. It has to do what, with what we consider modernity, the shopping mall. Okay, so when, when Bangalore gets wealthy, it's not just that young Indians can podcast and put their music up and, and, or study in America and get, read their own hometown newspapers or stay at home and be great innovators and remain in their culture, but also they get shopping malls. They get highways. They get all these forms of modernity that, of course, they want. They want to be part of modernity. Who, it's not for us to say you should remain you know, poor in villages because that won't ruin my landscape. But there is another kind of side to this that I think we have to sort of separate between culturally what the flat world will allow us to do, which is going to be incredibly particular. We're all going to be our own broadcasters, newspapers, bloggers, you know, over time. But at the same time, environmentally, as it brings more modernization, that's not going to be good for the environment, you know, because you're going to get a lot of the forms we see here over, over there. So you kind of got to separate the two. But I think. On, the, on this question of globalization of the local, that's an, that's an interesting idea, and I think it's worth really rethinking the whole of globalization as Americanization. So thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Last question. <laughs> Last one. Okay. Um, I was a little confused by something you said earlier. Uh -huh. When you were talking about um, what kind of jobs were most susceptible to outsourcing right. and what kind of jobs were likely to stay in industrialized countries. Right. Um, Not necessarily all over, actually. But yeah. yeah. Um, you indicated that you thought uh, right brain jobs were mm -hmm. more likely to stay in uh, rich countries right. than left wing jobs. Well, right brain jobs will be the source of good jobs. I really wasn't trying to suggest they'll be only here or only there. There'll be good middle class jobs, you know, maybe in India also. But that that's where the where, where the most secure jobs are going to be, they'll be from the right brain of your, not the left. That's what I, I meant. Well, what about um, very high level left brain jobs like biochemistry or computer science or? I kind of put those in the right brain myself. I may be wrong, but I, I, consider, I consider those actually right brain. But, but um, if you tell me they're left brain, then, um, <laughs> then I tell you there's some left brain jobs that'll be okay also. <laughs> <laughs> All right, was Thanks. Saying. We'll take one more real quick. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering how you thought this new flat world would affect um, higher education. Like, college has become so grossly competitive these days. If you want to go to a school like Williams or that place in New Haven you mentioned, right. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, you know, play five instruments and have saved dying infants in sub-Saharan right. Africa last summer. Right. So, I was just wondering how you thought this new flat world would affect higher it's education. A, it's a good are question. Are we going to outsource our professors? Yeah. Or, it's, um, you, know. <laughs> you know, a lot of it, I, you know, I, I don't have a simple answer for you. I wish I, I, wish I did. And I, I have to spend so much time just sort of thinking through just the basics. But, um, you know, I think the meta-meta story is that we've gone from kind of the information, from the Iron Age to the Industrial Age to the Information Age to the Talent Age. Because basically, when more and more people have access to the same technology and tools of innovation, your only sustainable edge, as, uh, as John Hagel talks about it and John C. Lee Brown, your only sustainable edge is your talent, is your human capital. And that's actually what's propelling all of this, because everyone intuits that, geez, everybody's got the same tools now. So the only differentiator is how well I nurture and develop my human capital. It wasn't like human capital wasn't important before, but when there were walls and things were slower, you know, it, it didn't have quite the urgency it does right now. And so what, what your generation is feeling is actually that transition. Um, and, you know, there's, it, it, it just seems to me there's, there's good news and, and there's bad news. The bad news is it's incredibly competitive. And, um, and, 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 and Williams and colleges like it, they're gems. And, and everyone would understandably want to see their daughter or son be able to go to such a school. But the other part of it is the truth is you can get a great education 
where I started today at the University of Minnesota, okay, and a lot more places today. And, um, and even though they don't have the brand, say, that, that a Williams does, the truth is you can now get a, a great education in so many more places. And so I know that as a society we built all this anxiety around it. But then it also is going to require us to think differently about what is the right education. And I didn't talk about this, but I'll just end with it. You know, I, 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 went, I focused on one school in, in the new version of the book, Georgia Tech. Um, because Georgia Tech has a really innovative uh, president, a guy named Wayne Clough, who's an engineer. And Wayne was a graduate of Georgia Tech. And he, um, uh, when he took over in 1996, Georgia Tech's um, graduation rate was 66%, which is terrible. And so he thought about it for a lot and was president for several years. And remember they had the Olympics in Atlanta. It was the same year that um, uh, he took over. And um, the Olympic committee gave Georgia Tech um, all their band instruments from the Olympic band. This is what started it all. And he started thinking about who are the most creative engineers he had ever worked with. And he realized they weren't always the smartest. People who got 1600s on their SATs. They're often the most quirky, synthetic, collaborative. So on a whim, he decided to change the entrance requirements to Georgia Tech. And what he did was, as you know, a school like Williams and Georgia Tech, they have a mix of things that they look at. And what he did was add to the mix, but at a very high you know, importance quotient, that to get into Georgia Tech, you have to play a musical instrument. You have to play a musical instrument sing in a choir, play in a band, be in an a cappella group, or be in a sports team. You have to be involved in a synthesizing collaborative endeavor. Today, 50% of the undergrads at Georgia Tech are in a band, a choir, a chorus, an a cappella group, or the orchestra, which now has the 24 tubas of the Olympic band. <laughs> and as Wayne Clough will tell you, if you watch any bowl game, nobody's got 24 tubas, okay? <laughs> and so I call this chapter of test tubes and tubas, okay? Because it's really about getting the balance between those two things. You know, Steve Jobs, I thought, said it so well in his graduation address last year at, at Stanford, his commencement address, when he talked about he dropped out of, you know, um, uh, Reed College after his freshman semester, but he stuck around Reed and he took a calligraphy course. And that calligraphy course taught him the miracle and magic of topography. And it was everything he learned in that calligraphy course that went into the keyboard of the Mac. And so, you know, what's going on in the world is kind of interesting. India and China are trying to get more like us. They're trying to get more creative and synthesizing because they think they're putting out a bunch of automatons, basically. We are trying to get more rigid, disciplined, and rote in a way, you know, and just studying to the test. And so somewhere there's got to be a grand convergence. But we can't lose sight of what really differentiates us in all this, you know, um, no child left behind and studying for the test and whatnot. I have a friend, I'll, I'll just leave you with this, Jerry Rao, he runs a tech company in India called Emphasis. And, Jerry and I were talking a couple of months ago, and he said something that really stuck in my mind. He said, you know, Tom, the future is very clear for India and China. We know just what we're going to do in the future. We're going to do in the future what you Americans do today. Your job is to invent the future. Never forget that. That is our job, to invent the future. As long as we keep doing that, and we are, as a society, we are hardwired to invent the future, but we, we can never, never lose sight of that. Thank you very much. Thank you.